So I'm David Rowan, editor of Wired, and it's an amazing honor to introduce Peter, who has a fabulous new bestseller out, um, Zero to One. And Peter is a busy man. He has a number of lives that all run at the same time. He is um, managing partner of the Founders Fund, president of, the, of Clarium Capital, co-founder of PayPal, of Palantir, um, makes good investments like $500,000 for 10.2% of a new company called Facebook in 2004. And when he tweets, he only ever tweets once, he gets 60,000 followers pretty much straight away. Now, we have big expectations for this evening because everywhere Peter has spoken in the last week or so about his new book, um, he's generated headlines. And the headlines include, you know, Twitter's horribly mismanaged. There's a lot of pot smoking there. Apple must innovate more. Technology stalled in 1970. The Wall Street Journal, competition is for losers. And I think my favorite one from Fortune, Peter Thiel disagrees with you. <laughs> so I'm expecting Peter to tear apart some of my questions. But first, please could we welcome him and give him the stage to talk about Zero to One. Thank you very much. Well, um, after, after that introduction, I'm, I'm actually quite nervous about uh, saying anything at all here, since uh, I feel like I'm on, being recorded, and uh, it, may, it may come back to haunt me in all kinds of strange ways. In, in, in writing a book about entrepreneurship, um, one of the one of the uh, this and teach, it just came out of a class that uh, I taught at Stanford in 2012, and one of the challenges in teaching about entrepreneurship or writing about it is that I think people tend to sort of write books, um, business books, that make one of two kinds of mistakes. There's one where it's sort of, uh, you tell all these war stories. It must be like, this is what I did at PayPal in 99. This is how we combined email and money. And this is you know, how this all worked. And uh, that's not terribly relevant to people uh, who are interested in starting new businesses or, or learning from that. And then I think the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, these uh, business books, which I think are sort of pseudo-scientific. And it's like this formula, and you do follow these five steps, and you will have a successful company. And I, I think that approach also does not work for a similar reason, which is that uh, I think every moment in the history of business and the history of technology happens only once. The next Bill Gates will not be starting an operating system company. The next Larry Page won't start a search engine. The next Mark Zuckerberg would not be starting a social network. If you are copying these people, you're not learning from them. Uh, and um, and so the, the the theme of my book is that uh, what's actually important is the things that make these companies singular and uh, and different. And, um, and you know, this chapter is entitled, you know, this opening line from Anna Karenina, um, which says, all happy families are alike. All unhappy families are unhappy in their own special way. Uh, and I think the opposite is true of business. All, um, all happy companies are different. All, um, all unhappy companies are alike in that they've failed to escape the uh, sameness that is competition. And, um, and this was this, the, the title of, the chap of one of the chapters is All Happy Companies Are Different. It got, uh, when, when the Wall Street Journal excerpted it and, uh, and uh, published it, uh, they, uh, they retitled that to Competition is for Losers, which is a somewhat punchier way of putting that idea. And, um, and you know, I try to get at this uniqueness question through these various contrarian questions that I think are, are good to ask. One, the, the business one I always is like, what great company is nobody building? The, the, the more intellectual uh, version of this question that I think makes for always a terrific interview question is, tell me something that's true that almost nobody agrees with you on. And this is a shockingly hard question for at least two different reasons. Uh, First reason is that we've been taught that truth is conventional, that truth is just simply what people agree on. Uh, and so it automatically sounds like you have to be really brilliant, and it's really hard to discover some new truth that uh, is uh, hitherto unsuspected. Um, but it's, it's also very difficult because of just the social context in which uh, the, these questions get asked. So if, uh, if you're answering it and the interviewer says, yes, I believed that all along, that's uh, uh, that, then, that, then that's by definition a bad answer. And a good answer is one that the person asking it does not want, uh, agree with or does not want to hear. And, um, and, you know, and it requires a certain amount of courage. And we live in a world in which I think courage is an even shorter supply than, than genius. 
So what I want to uh, what I want to try to do in my brief comments tonight is I'm just going to give uh, a few few answers. My my book is just a whole series of answers to that question, the things I believe to be true that uh, most people uh, don't agree with me on. Um, but I'll, I'll give three um, three uh, quick answers to it tonight in my in my comments, and then we'll uh, go to the questions. Um, so the first one, um, uh, and this is this sort of flows out of this idea that you want um, all happy companies to be different and unique. Um, most people think that capitalism and competition are synonyms. I believe they are antonyms. Um, you know, a capitalist is someone who accumulates capital. A world of competition is a world where all the profits are competed away. And so if you're an entrepreneur or a founder, you always want to be building a monopoly. You do not want to be uh, doing something where you're in cutthroat, ferocious competition. A restaurant is a terrible business to go into. It's super competitive and extremely non-capitalistic. People never make money opening restaurants. Uh, and uh, I sort of give Google as the example of a company at the other end of the spectrum where you have enormous profits um, and you've had no sort of serious competition in uh, 12 years ever since they definitively distanced themselves from uh, Yahoo and Microsoft back in 2002. And, um, and I think one of the things that's, that these breakthrough zero to one companies have is that they, uh, they, they do things where uh, when, you, when you do something new, you, um, you are in this sort of happy place where um, you're not sort of directly competing with too many people and then you have a product that you are offering the world that does not yet exist. And, uh, and that's, that's, what, that's what makes these uh, franchises uh, so, so extremely valuable. Um, I think this question of competition and monopoly, there's sort of many different reasons. It's, it's, it's sort of, I think, very underappreciated. Uh, you know, sort of there's always this nuance where the people who have monopolies generally don't talk about it. And the people um, who are in perfect competition pretend that they have something special. So, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're running Google, um, your talking points are, you know, we're, a, we're not a search company, but we're a technology company. And we're competing ferociously with Apple on the phone and with Facebook on social and Microsoft on office and we're building cars and we're competing with the car companies and we're just, there's just like competition everywhere and uh, we're not the monopoly the government is looking for. Um, and, then, um, and then if you were say trying to open a restaurant in London, you would say, uh, you know, you're trying to get investors to invest in your restaurant. You will, um, you will say something like, well, this is a completely uh, and, and then the investors will say, well, I don't want to invest in a restaurant. It's a bad business. It'll lose money. And you'll say, no, this is a completely different restaurant. It's one of a kind. It's the only French Nepalese fusion cuisine in, um, in London and in, in like, uh, you know, South Paddington or wherever, in some small area of London. And, um, and, uh, and so you will, again, artificially define what you're doing in a way that's very different. And so, so I think this question always gets obscured by the people inside these businesses, and that's why it's this very important idea that's uh, much bigger than, than we think it is. But I think it's also, um, we also um, get trapped in uh, competitive cycles for sort of a psychological reason. It's often, um, we often find it reassuring to uh, be in crowds, to do things that lots of other people are doing. Um, and um, and uh, you know, the, the word ape already in the time of Shakespeare meant both primate and to imitate. And there's something about human nature that's disturbingly lemming-like, sheep-like, ape-like, herd-like. Um, and uh, and this, is, this is always a dangerous sort of behavior pattern when you're starting a business, because when you're in a crowd, it's the crowd of people you're, you're competing against. Uh, um, and you know, in some, in, you know in, I've been a bit, sort of a very big critic of, uh, of the uh, higher education system. Uh, because I think that sort of encapsulates this ideology of competition in its uh, purest form, where you have to compete on you know, all these sort of tests and jumping through all these hoops. You get to the same sort of uh, short list of elite universities in the US, then you go into the same short list of elite jobs. And, um, and a lot of it gets, uh, gets driven by, by people not really asking, uh, what are they doing? Why is it important? But you know, when you're focused on competition, you're always focused on beating the person next to you. And you do get better at the thing you're competing on. Like if you're in a high school swimming team, you'll swim a little bit faster than you otherwise would have swum. But uh, you often lose sight of what's truly important and truly valuable. And there's sort of this autobiographical part of this book where if I had to give advice to my younger self, uh, um, you know, I was, I was hyper-tracked. I was, uh, I was you know, in, 
eighth grade um, junior high school, one of my uh, friends wrote in my yearbook that I would surely get into Stanford in four or five years' time, and that's what happened. And then I went to Stanford Law School, and then I sort of got tracked into sort of a big law firm in, um, in Manhattan, uh, where from the outside, everybody was trying to get in. On the inside, everybody was trying to leave. Um, and um, you know, uh, after I, I left after seven months and three days, uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the people uh, down down the hall from me told me it was very reassuring to see me leave. He had no idea that it was possible to escape from Alcatraz, which um, was of course all he had to do was go out the front door. But uh, but it was uh, um, it was again the, the so much of people's identity was wrapped up in winning these various competitive dynamics that they could not uh, think about this. So if I gave advice to my give advice to my younger self, it would be to you know, really think hard, why was I doing these things? Was I engaged in, um, was I doing these things because I genuinely wanted to do them? Or was it simply a sort of a prestige status game that I was playing, uh, which, um, and I think if I was honest, uh, that there was way more of that going on. And there's, I think, a lot of that going on with a lot of us that we should always uh, think hard about, um, about doing less of. Second, uh, second contrarian idea I'll, I'll throw out is, I think the sort of a conventional view is that there are um, that uh, that there are not that many answers left to this question. What's true that uh, nobody agrees with you on? We believe that all these truths have already been discovered in the past, um, and you know, and maybe there's still some things, but they're just about impossible to figure out. So there are conventions that we understand. There are mysteries that nobody can figure out. Um, but I, I, by contrast, think there still are a lot of things left on intermediate level. There are a lot of things that I call secrets, which are Truths that are hard but possible to, to discover, um, and um, and I think I think there is always a secret at the core of every great business. There's some um, some sort of research program that uh, or some uh, some area that, that people are really really focused on. They think about really hard, and it sort of advances um, their thinking to the point where they get an understanding about something that other people do not yet have. You know, at, at PayPal. We were very interested in uh, um, 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 sort of the cryptocurrencies and um, uh, encryption technology and currencies, and could they be intersected? Could you build a new digital currency? This was a question that you know animated us tremendously. We, we didn't quite succeed in building one at PayPal, even though we had T-shirts that said that we we're going to be the new world currency. We didn't quite succeed in that in that goal. But uh, but that sort of a in-depth, substantive focus actually did help us think really hard about how do you architect a new payment system, how do you do certain things differently, and it, it, it was, was a key part of inspiring us. And I think there are sort of many secrets left, and this is something, um, this is something we generally do not understand. And it's, it's, it's not obvious where one should look. You know, if, you're, if you were living in the 17th or 18th century, you could look at a map and there were empty spaces left on the map, and you could become an explorer and go and discover those places. So there was sort of a natural geographical sense in which there were secrets left. Or um, in the 19th century, uh, there were still you know, places in the periodic table of elements that were empty, and you could sort of do some basic chemistry and find some secrets. And, and there is sort of a sense that maybe geography or chemistry are fields that are, you know, basic chemistry and geography are sort of fields that are closed. But I think most fields are not like that. I think most fields are still ones where there's a tremendous amount of innovation possible. Uh, certainly, this is true in, um, in the uh, computer field, where we've seen uh, massive innovation in, in recent decades in the world of bits, computers, internet, mobile internet, that whole ensemble. Um, I think we've seen less innovation in the world of atoms, um, uh, you know, transportation, um, energy, clean energy, biomedical, biotech, um, space travel, all the kinds of things people thought about in the 50s and 60s. But I think, it's, um, I think it's not because there's some law of nature that it's hard to innovate or impossible to innovate in these areas. It's just that there's sort of been this cultural change where we haven't tried as much. And, and we, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, there's, there's a lot of this has a self-fulfilling character. If you, if you think that you can't find a secret, then you're not going to try and you will not look and you will not be a person who ever finds one. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and so failure, pessimism can have a self-fulfilling character as uh, conversely, if you think there's a lot to be discovered, um, progress can accelerate and more, more things can happen. So second sort of uh, contrarian truth that I believe to be true is that there are actually are many secrets left to be discovered. Third, um, third, uh, third idea, and this one's maybe a little bit bigger picture. 
I, I think that uh, in a uh, successful 21st century, this century is going to be a, a, a great and peaceful century. I think there are two big trends that have to continue. There's a trend of globalization and a trend of technology. And I think it's always important to think of these two things as very different. Globalization involves copying things that work, horizontal growth, extensive progress going from one to n. Um, and I always draw globalization on the, on the x-axis. Technology involves doing new things, going from zero to one, vertical or intensive progress. And I always draw it on a y-axis. And I, I always set up that contrast, because I think there's a tendency for people to, um, to define technology and globalization as synonymous. And I think it's worth thinking of these as very different vectors of, of, of progress. We, um, um, the, uh, the, uh, and if we sort of think about the last 200 years, there have been many periods where we've had one or the other or both, and which again underscores how they're different. The 19th century, you had tremendous amounts of both globalization and technological progress. You had both in the 19th century. 1914, after World War I starts, globalization goes into reverse, um, and uh, there's less trade. The world becomes less connected. You know, Iron Curtain goes down. Parts of the world more or less are completely cut off. And it doesn't really resume till uh, Kissinger goes to China in 1971. And we've had the last four decades of ferocious globalization. Technology has been, we had a lot of progress, 1914 to 71. Since 71, I would argue it's been more limited and, um, and with a stress on, on, the, on the computer side. And so we've had an era of globalization without technology and um, sorry, uh, technology without globalization and then globalization without technology that's characterized the last hundred years in, in contrast to the century that came before. Um, it's the sort of shift uh, from the 50s and 60s today is, is in, in, in the way we talk about the world. In the 50s or 60s, you would have said that the world was divided into the first world and the third world. The first world was the place where accelerating change was happening. The third world was the place that was sort of permanently screwed up and broken. Today, we speak of the developing and the developed world. The developing world is that part of the world that will copy the developed world. And, um, and it's sort of this convergence theory of globalization. China is the epitome of it. It has a very straightforward plan for the next 20 years. It's just going to copy everything that works in the West. It'll skip a few steps. But it has a very straightforward uh, plan uh, ahead of it. But um, this developing, developed dichotomy, while it's sort of pro-globalization, is also implicitly anti-technological, because it tells us that we are living in the part of the world that is developed, that is done, that is finished, where nothing new is going to happen, that's stagnant, where we can expect nothing to change, uh, where we can expect the younger generation to um, do, do no better than their parents, maybe worse. Um, and, um, and I think this is a conception of our world that we should resist very strongly. Uh, and, um, and I think we should not even accept the idea that we're living in the developed world, that we're living in some sort of end of technology era. Um, and so I think we should um, always return to this question, how do we go about developing the developed world? Thank you very much. I was going to ask you which important truth do very few people agree with you on, but I think um, you've answered my question. There's a big theme in the book. A number of interviewers uh, actually still ask me that even after, after I gave a talk similar to this one. So you paid, you paid way more attention. I stopped. There's so much we could focus on in the book. But um, there's a theme that comes up repeatedly, which is the value of the monopoly business. You talk about the history of progress as a history of better monopoly businesses replacing incumbents. Yet, if you look over the last century, monopolies haven't always acted in the most enlightened way. They haven't always benefited the consumer, as governments would have hoped. And governments have often had to come in and regulate. Isn't this a bit of a pure view of the value of a monopoly? Well, um, so there's, there's always a. You have to always distinguish uh, looking at this from the inside and the outside. So from the point of view of someone starting a business, um, from the point of view of a founder, an entrepreneur, you want to always build a monopoly. And it's, it's, it's always uh, great to have one from, uh, from, from the inside. Um, and it gives you way more cushion. You can do all sorts of things much better. You can be, you can, I think you can be a more ethical company. When Google says, uh, don't be evil, on, on one level, it's a marketing ploy. But on another level, you, can, you, can, um, you don't have to care about nothing but money in a company where you're making so much of it. So, uh, so um, on the inside, 
I, I think you always want to want to have a monopoly. Uh, from from the outside, uh, from the point of view of society, the question are are monopolies good or bad? And I think they are. I agree with the critique of monopolies in a stagnant world, where it's like the Parker Brothers board game, and the monopolist is just a rent collector or a toll collector. Um, but I think that if if you have a dynamic world where people are inventing and creating new things, um, um, these are actually positive. So when Apple builds a smartphone that just works. It has a monopoly on the iPhone for many years, and I think it still has somewhat of a monopoly in, in various ways today. Um, and that's a good monopoly because it created something that did not exist before. And the sort of the common sense way to differentiate good from bad monopolies, well, and lines are a little bit fuzzy, but the common sense way is just do consumers think it's a good thing or do they think it's a bad thing? So they might think the post office is a bad government structured monopoly. Uh, whereas Apple uh, would be would be seen as a as a good one, but is it healthy for the wider economy if a single company like Facebook owns so much data on people's preferences, that real time knowledge based on what we're doing mobile, and they can set the rules? They're more powerful than governments. Well, I um, you know it's, I certainly uh, much prefer Facebook to own the data than, than the government. I think that um, I think that. Uh, I, th I think I think I think you have to draw all these distinctions. Um, you know, it's it's uh, there, there's there's an important debate about privacy. There are important questions about um, about um, about uh, how one draws these lines. But I think the uh, you know the Facebook product has has created a lot of value in the world. It's made the world more connected. It's helped people stay in touch with their friends, um, and I think it's been a it's been an enormous net plus to to people um, people all over the place. Um, you know, I think, um, so yeah. Every startup in its pitch talks about it's going to come and disrupt a sector. Um, you say in the book that disruption is a self congratulatory buzzword for anything trendy and new. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I sort, certainly go after all these different uh, all these different uh, categories. Uh, I'm, I'm always skeptical of anything that gets you know used uh, this much nonstop by people. So uh, you know the uh, disruptive person in elementary school gets sent to the principal's office. Disruptors are people who look for trouble. They typically find it. Um, you know. Um, uh, um, Napster was a classically disruptive business that sought to take on the mu disrupt the music industry, um, and you know it's uh, had this disruptive name. You know, you, what do you what do you nap? You nap some music. You nap a kid. You know, it's, it's, uh, and you, um, and um, and so there's always a sense where um, um, uh, disruption already starts by thinking of itself in competitive terms, where you're defining yourself against somebody. And I, th I think you don't want to take your bearings from breaking things, but rather from building things. So we have to go for an entirely new market. I, I think those are the, the best companies are ones that go for for uh, broadly uh, new markets. Uh, you know, it's, it's cer certainly if you if you go after an existing market, that's where uh, that's where you're going to get the most ferocious resistance, the most intense competition. Um, you know, PayPal went after online payments. You know, Visa and Mastercard were not. Altogether happy because it was a new market. They thought they perhaps should have owned, but um, but it was not like we were taking away business directly from them. And in some ways, we were actually expanding the universe of payments that they enabled. And so, at the end of the day, they didn't come after us nearly as much as they would have had we say tried to disrupt their business in some direct way. So why didn't PayPal become the default payment mechanism? Why didn't PayPal become Bitcoin? Well, I think payment mechanisms and currencies are, are, are related, but quite different uh, sorts of things. Um, so I think yeah, uh, PayPal set out to build a new world currency. We did build a rather powerful internet payment system. Um, Bitcoin, I think at this point, is, is somewhat the opposite. Uh, it has actually created a new currency, at least on the level of speculation. Um, and the payment system part of it's actually rather lacking, where it's hard to transact in bitcoins. People will do it for things that are illegal and they can't buy otherwise, but for legal payments, it's actually quite hard to do. And so I think the so sort of the opposite of uh, a set of things from 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 that which uh, PayPal had. It's 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 quite hard. You know, in, in general, I think a currency is, is a much harder thing to build than a payment system because it requires a much larger network effect. You know, it's much harder uh, to buy into it. Um, you know the, uh, you know when I was, um, I don't even know how to have it on me, but you know the, the the prop that I would always use when I was uh, 
a CEO would pay post, he'd hold up a hundred dollar bill in front of an audience and it would be like hypnotic, everybody would want it. And there's sort of this network effect to money. It's very difficult to create a new currency because you're competing with, um, with an existing very large network already. There's a lot of people in the Valley though putting big money into Bitcoin businesses thinking this is going to be the one. Are you not excited? I am. I am still a little bit more skeptical because they've not yet gotten the payment system part of it to work. But, uh, but I think that's the, you know, if you said what would make me more bullish on Bitcoin, it's if there were more, um, more legal payments happening on it. So when you meet entrepreneurs, what personal characteristics do you define in those that you think are going to be the big success stories? Well, I think, um, I think these, um, these uh, zero to one companies they're, they're generally not solo efforts. It's always a bit of a team effort of people working together. And so you, 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 know, you want a great business idea, you want a great technology, you want very talented people. But one of the very critical questions is how well do these people actually work, uh, work together? And um, because I think, I think the most common cause for failure is that the people just don't get along and sort of blows up, uh, it blows up internally uh, way before it gets destroyed externally by by com external competition, so people internally don't get along. Um, the uh, and so, a question I always like to ask is the prehistory question. You know, how did you meet? How long have you known each other? Uh, all those sorts of questions. Bad answers are things like, we met a week ago at a uh, entrepreneurial networking event. We both wanted to start companies, and um, and that's sort of like saying we got married at the slot machines in Vegas. Uh, you might hit the jackpot. Probably a very bad idea. Um, the, the, the good answers are things like, we met, you know, we've been working for a number of years, we've been friends for many years, you know, there's some complementarity, maybe you know, one of us is focused on the technology side, the other person is focused more on the business side. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a good answer. I don't know if you notice a correlation between very successful tech businesses, particularly coming from the Valley, and people with, let's say, limited social skills. There is a spectrum. Are these the sorts of true correlations that you see? There is, there is a curious correlation where uh, some sort of mild form of Asperger's uh, seems to be linked with, uh, with a lot of these companies. And I, I think we should always flip that around and um, think of this as a, like really an indictment of our society uh, and ask the question, what is it about our society where people who are uh, socially well adapted are um, subtly talked out of all their original ideas before they even have them because they pick up on all these social cues and they can sense, oh, this is a little bit too weird, this is a little bit too strange, it's not quite respectable, what do people think of this? And uh, you are talked out of your truly original and creative ideas before they are even fully formed. You're picking up on all these social cues and they, um, and, and they, they lead you to, to give up on them. So I, th I think there is some sort of dynamic like this. Um, they've done this study at Harvard Business School, of, uh, which, which you can think of as a very non-Asperger-like place where you have people who are super well adapted socially. They're very extroverted. Uh, they don't have very strong convictions generally. Um, and they are sort of in this hothouse environment for two years where they talk to one another about what they will do for the rest of their lives. And uh, the, the sort of conclusion at the end of the two years is that the largest cohort generally goes into uh, trying to catch the last wave, which is always somewhat of a mistake. In 1989, everybody wanted to work for Michael Milken. It was one or, one or two years before he went to jail for all the junk bomb trading. People were never interested in technology or Silicon Valley, except in 99, 2000, at the top of the dot-com mania when they, they all moved to Silicon Valley. 2005 to 07, it was all real estate and, and private equity. And, um, and so I do, think, uh, I do think there's some very odd uh, dynamic like that. So what mistakes are we in the tech world making now? Uh, you know, there are, there are probably, well, there are many categories of mistakes that, that we're making. You know, certainly one, one, one broad category that flows from my, my monopoly thesis is that um, you often want to look at small markets. If you want to get, to be, to be a monopoly, you have to get to large markets share. So you want to go after small initial markets. You know, Facebook initially went after the 10,000 people at Harvard. It went from zero to 60% market share in 10 days, and that was a very auspicious start. And then you sort of 
grew out in concentric circles. PayPal, uh, our initial market was eBay power sellers. There were about 20,000 of them, and we got to about 30% market share within about three months. Again, a, a very good start. Um, you know, the, the opposite end of the spectrum, um, you know, one of the sort of one of the big red flags in any presentation I get is where the first slide says we have a big market, and this was this was a this was a mistake that all the clean tech companies in the last decade made, where um, the first slide was we have a we're in the energy market, it's measured in hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars, uh, and we are a tiny minnow in a vast ocean, and uh, what that means is that you have to not just beat the other um, nine thin film solar panel companies, but then you have to also beat the other 90 other types of solar panel companies, and then you have to beat the wind companies and the fracking companies, and, the, uh, and then you have uh, Chinese manufacturing come out of nowhere, and so you're sort of a minnow in a vast ocean, not what you want to be. I think the phrase you use is, most clean tech founders would have been better off opening a new vegan restaurant in Palo Alto. But you do, talking about... Well, they're both trillion dollar market, restaurant market is also trillion dollar. Trillion dollar market. But then it does come down to timing, because there's a lot of very effective clean tech businesses now. One of them is Solar City, Elon Musk's business and his cousins, which you have invested in. Um, and is it about choosing the timing? Well, I think it's, you have to get a number of things right. So I think you have to get the monopoly question right. You have to get the timing question right. You have to get, you know, there's be a, I, I think you want to have some secret that you understand that other people don't. You want to get th the team right. So there are a whole a whole set of these things that, uh, that, that, uh, that come together. Um, you know, I, 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 I think that, um, you know, I think Tesla is a very impressive company that, 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 has, that, is, that has, has, has worked uh, incredibly well. Um, and in some sense, they actually started with, a, with a, what was sort of a relatively small market. Electric sports cars were a, actually a smaller market than the energy market as a whole. It was still a pretty big market. It was still non-trivial to, to raise the roughly half billion dollars in capital it, it took, but, um, but it was about as, they did about as, um, as, as, it was a small market that was about as big as you could possibly be. Elon Musk, your co-founder at PayPal, as well as producing very cool electric cars and solar panels, is sending space rockets up eventually to Mars. Yes. Just the space station yes. in the short term. How do we get more Elon Musks? You know, it's, it's, um, I, 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 you know, it's always, I don't, I don't know if there's a simple formula for this. We had, um, um, it's, uh, you know, the, the PayPal business was actually quite successful in producing a series of these entrepreneurs. There have been, uh, about uh, of the 220 people who were involved with uh, PayPal in um, 2002 in, in Silicon Valley, uh, there had been about seven billion dollar plus companies started by them. This was Elon's, uh, t Tesla, and SpaceX. I was involved in starting Palantir. My friend Reid Hoffman started LinkedIn, um, YouTube, uh, YouTube. Uh, there's Yammer, Yelp, um, and um, and so there's always this question. What was it about PayPal that was so conducive to this? And it's, it's always hard to know because whenever you have just like a sample size of one, it was one company and sort of happened. You know, it's always hard to, to really um, be too scientific about it. But, but one of the variables that I think may have been very important was that the lesson people learned inside PayPal was that it was hard but possible to build a great business. So we had a lot of ups and downs. There were a lot of challenges. But at the end, it was a very successful exit to, to eBay. Um, I think the lesson people learn in most of the companies they're involved in is very different. They're either in companies where things fail, and the lesson they learn is that it's impossible to build a great business. So if you work in a failed company, you will typically, the next time around, try to do something uh, less ambitious. You may succeed, but it will be a lesser business uh, because you will aim for something smaller. Um, or if you're in a super successful company where everything just worked seamlessly from day one, a Microsoft or a Google, um, you will learn the lesson that it's easy. Um, and I think uh, to build a great business, which I think is just as toxic as the lesson that it's impossible. And so I think most people end up finding themselves in contexts where they learn that it's easy or impossible to build great bus businesses. And these are equally mistaken lessons. I think the, the intermediate one that, uh, and the intermediate mindset that it's hard but possible is a, is a critical component uh, to it. 
pretty much every major city around the world now is trying to become the local Silicon Valley. Consultants are making a fortune teaching innovation to governments. Um, how reproducible is the success story of the Valley? You're in London now. We have a lot of very, very successful companies. Do you take London seriously as a tech center? Well, I'm, I'm always skeptical of copying things. So I, I think just like you shouldn't try to copy Microsoft or Facebook, um, copying Silicon Valley is probably also the, the, the wrong idea. Um, you know, one, one reason it's the wrong idea is we don't even actually know what makes Silicon Valley work. And maybe it's the weather, maybe it's non-compete agreements are not enforced in California, maybe it is there are these crazy network effects, uh, there's sort of all kinds of um, you know, uh, different explanations one can give. And so um, even if we wanted to, I'm not sure we, we even know what, what makes it work. And then I think more fundamentally, when you're, when you're copying something, you already are setting yourself up to be defined in a lesser way. You know, if you're the if you're the Oxford of Iceland, that's not quite Oxford. And 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 so in a similar way, um, uh, calling things, um, you know, you, there's some way in which you don't want to you don't want to define your way yourself in a way that's that's derivative. The something of somewhere is often the nothing of nowhere. Um, I think that um, I think instead what one should try to do is think really hard. What are the kinds of things that uh, could be done, say, in London, better than anywhere else in the world? Um, you know, I, th I think one of the things that uh, that uh, and so I think, for example, you know, we're uh, we're investors in TransferWise, and I think I think which I think is doing great as a as a company. Uh, and I think uh, I think there's perhaps a lot of innovation in the area of financial technology that could take place in in London because um, this is a finance center. It's a natural thing that London can do much better than Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is not a global financial center. Um, and, uh, it's, and London, I think, is also better than New York, by the way, since um, uh, people in New York, uh, New York's very self-hating. People hate the finance industry in New York in a way in which they don't hate it as much in London. So if you start a financial technology company in London, this would be a cool thing to do. It would not be considered as cool a thing to do in New York. You also invested, I think, in DeepMind, an artificial intelligence company. And you have, sort of, you have sort of eccentric British technologies that get developed, too. Um, and, uh, this Which is a company that Google bought for 400 million pound, and they hadn't released a product. Um, so it's, it's the, uh, yeah, it was sort of a Manhattan project for AI. That was, the, that was, the, uh, uh, that was and remains the, uh, the goal of DeepMind. So they assembled a phenomenal, uh, phenomenally talented team. And, and I think... Uh, so I think there are there are things like that that that, that work uh, that work quite well. But but you know there's no reason that innovation, in general, has to happen only in Silicon Valley. You know there are, Silicon Valley does have some advantages, but it probably also has disadvantages. The network effects that help Silicon Valley, um, I think also in some cases probably um, lead to more lemming-like and crowd-like behavior, which I think is is so problematic. Do you worry about what artificial intelligence will? do to us, to our ability to earn a living? I think, I think I, I'm of the view that strong AI is still quite a long ways off. Um, you know, if we ever were to get artificial intelligence, uh, if we were ever to build computers that are as smart as human beings in every way, uh, this would be an, a momentous event. This would be, you know, it would be as, as significant as extraterrestrials landing on this, on this planet. Um, and, you know, if aliens landed, the first question would not be about the economy and what does it mean for your job. The first question would be political. Are they friendly? Are they unfriendly? And so, um, so I think, uh, I think uh, to even frame it as a question about jobs is to understate the importance or, 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 or um, seismic nature AI would represent. Um, I think short of strong AI, however, I, I think people um, are way too worried about computers in this economic sense. I think this is, we have... And we live in a we live in a society that's generally um, is, is we live in a financial and a capitalistic age. I I sort of argued elsewhere that I think we do not live in a scientific or technological age, and and, uh, and, and most people in the U.S., Western Europe, really don't like science. They don't like technology. They're biased against it in all sorts of ways. It's true of the people. It's true of the politicians. It's true of the governments. It's true of the culture. The easy way to see this is you just look at all the Hollywood movies that basically show technology that doesn't work, that kills people, is destructive. You can choose whether it's The Matrix or Terminator or, or Avatar or Elysium. I watched the Gravity movie the other day. You'd never want to go 
to Mars, even to outer space. You'd be much happy, happy, happier being back on some muddy island somewhere um, on, on this world. And that's, that reflects the sensibility of most people that the future is something to be feared and that, should, uh, that, we, should try to, that we should try to prevent. And, I, um, and that's why I think uh, people who are involved in the scientific or technological worlds are the counterculture in our society today. Uh, and um, and it is, it's sort of a very unusual perspective to think that the future is something you hope for. So roundabout answer. Um, so I think this, this idea that um, today's computers are uh, replacing people um, is just another one of these technological angst narratives we have. I think it's not true. I think computers and people are fundamentally different. Uh, they're good at really different things. They're fundamentally complementary, not substitutes. The, you know, the, the much bigger challenge for the middle class in the developed world comes from globalization because people in India, people in China are actually not that different from us. They can substitute for our labor, and that's where that's where the substitution is taking place. I don't think we should stop globalization, but we should, you know, it has some problematic aspects. I think technology has far fewer. You also think that technology can help fight aging. How much can we solve this problem in our lifetimes? Well, we've, we've, made, a, we've made a lot of progress over the last 150 years. You know, the, the maximum life expectancy in 1840 was 46 years among Swedish women. Today, it's uh, something like 87, 88 years. Life expectancy has gone up by about two and a half years um, a decade. So every day that you survive, your life expectancy goes up by five or six hours. Um, I think that... Um, um, and so th there's always been this debate between the, uh, you know, the mathematicians who sort of extrapolated these curves and the biologists who always argued that um, you, weren't, you weren't gonna make any more progress, you're about to hit the wall. Um, and I, I, would, I would tend to side with the mathematicians over the biologists, and I think, I think we, can do, we can do a lot more. Um, I, I don't think we're going to solve, you know, um, we're gonna find sort of a single magic pill that, um, that makes people live forever. I think it will be a lot of specific walking and tackling, but I think, you know, I think we could make a lot of progress on cancer. I think there's no reason that we could not cure Alzheimer's or dementia. You know, one out of three people at age 85 has dementia. I think we could be doing a lot more, and it's, it's really, um, you know, it's always, again, I, I think it's outrageous that our culture is so complacent about these things, and uh, again, I think there's room for um, a lot of progress in these areas. So when you hear of supporters of the singularity, people like Ray Kurzweil talking about being able to defeat aging, the body can live forever, what do you think? Well, I think, I think it's, you know, I think this has been, this has been a core um, animating idea of the entire modern scientific project. Uh, you know, the, uh, the search for uh, the water of life that the alchemists had was as great as for the uh, thing that would transmute everything into gold. They, they were actually, the alchemists were more interested in living forever than in finding uh, the, the thing that substituted everything for gold. It was, you know, Francis Bacon, the New Atlantis. The, this, is, this is the whole, the whole project of, uh, of modern science. And so, uh, so you know, it's, it's hard to know how much, you know, how much we can you know, change the world from a place where life is nasty, brutish, and short. But, um, but I think, uh, I think the, the moral thing is to, is to push it as far as we possibly can in the other direction. You know, I know there are all sorts of arguments on the other side. People say that, you know, death is a natural part of life, uh, and I, to which I always respond that I think um, it is a, at least as natural for us to be fighting death. And, uh, and I think that, you know, we have this modality where we uh, are either, we either accept it or deny it. And so I think most people are sort of in the schizophrenic mode where they um, accept death and deny it at the same time. Um, and what acceptance and denial, however, have in common is they're both um, modes of thinking that stop you from doing anything. Yeah. It's going to happen or there's nothing you can do about it. It's not, it's not going to happen or it's going to happen and there's nothing you can do about it. Both of those modes tell you we shouldn't do anything. And I think we should uh, be spending more time fighting it. I'm quite upset that we're not having an argument, actually. I feel I'm missing out on the Peter Thiel experience. You're not shouting me down. Um, you're I, a man with I never shout people down. <laughs> you're a man with political views. Um, you have strong views about education and other things. Let me just imagine with you that you're suddenly in the White House. It's not going to happen. Let's just imagine. 
I, 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 What's on I, your I list? Think thought, you... I always think fictional thought experiments are very treacherous things, though. <laughs> but let's just say you but could it, change does it the rules. I, does it mean that I'm mayor of the United States, I'm kissing babies all day long? Well, what or would does you it like mean that change? I'm dictator? What would be I mean, top these are of all, How far can we play this thought experiment? What would you want to change in how America is run? Well, you know, uh, my, 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 uh, you know my, my single issue is that uh, we have to make more progress in science and technology. And uh, you know, I, I don't think the government can do that much on this because it's so hostile to these things. It reflects a population that's hostile. I think at best we can hope that the government um, gets out of the way of, of stopping this sort of progress. There was a time in the past when government was able to coordinate things and do things. I, I don't think we're living in that sort of a society anymore. You know, um, the US was able to build a nuclear bomb in three and a half years in a project organized by the government, or you could put someone on the moon in the Apollo program in the 1960s. Um, these sorts of things would be utterly inconceivable today. You know, a letter from Einstein to the White House would get lost in the mailroom. And people say, you know, who is this crazy scientist who thinks you can do this, uh, this completely different sort of a thing? Um, and so I think, um, I think the, 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 the best role for government in our, our world is, is, is somewhat more limited uh, because you know, it's, I, I, was, I, I looked at this the other day, there are you know, 535 congressmen and senators in the US, and by a generous count, maybe 35 of them have a background in science wow. or engineering. Um, and uh, the rest of them are like in the Middle Ages. They, you know, they don't know that solar panels don't work at night or windmills don't work when the wind is not blowing. And, um, and, so, uh, and so I think we, we can't have that great a hope for how much innovation can happen from government if that's if that's how it's constituted. Now again, if we can change everybody in the government, that's then we're again playing with a very crazy thought experiment though. Governments are trying to map the brain though. Obama's got a big project, the Europeans have a big project. There, look, there's 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 a lot of funding that goes to various kinds of ideas, but um, the, the politicization of the funding I think has uh, has often had this counterproductive effect. You know, in in much of science I, I, I worry that there's been a sort of Gresham's law at work where the people who are nimble in the art of writing grant applications to governments have replaced the uh, eccentric people who are the truly great scientists. And so the, uh, the, um, the eccentric university professor is a species that I think is going extinct very fast um, uh, because of the sort of Gresham's law dynamics. So yes, there's, there's a lot of money going to projects. The projects that get funded are consensus projects. The experiments that get done are experiments that everybody thinks will work. And experiments that everyone thinks will work are ones that I, I think rarely advance science at all. I mean, the interesting experiments are ones that no one thinks work and that actually end up working, but those, those are very hard to fund politically. So you've been back, backing a seasteading organization to try and create a new kind of nation. How's that going? Uh, that still has a long ways to go. Um, it is, it is, um, it is a, it's a small project I got involved in. It, it, it always generates enormous interest. Um, because I think, I think people do have a sense that the frontier is somewhat closed and there's something odd and that there's no longer a place you can go to in this world where you could start a new community or a new society. And so, um, so even talking about doing something as speculative as building uh, communities on, on platforms on the ocean um, naturally um, uh, generates an enormous amount of, uh, of conversation. Uh, you, know, I th I think, I think it, you know, I think figuring out ways to reopen the frontier is, is very important. It's not clear we can do it geographically because you know, the land surface is fully covered, outer space is still pretty far away. Um, but, uh, but I think you know, the frontier is this place where new things happen. There's sort of a certain logic to California being the place where so much innovation happened. It was the place where the geographical frontier ended. You went west to go to the frontier. The frontier ended in California. And even though it's geographically, you know, we are finished exploring it, um, it, uh, it is still the place where uh, a lot of new things happen. So on the Founders Fund website, you famously say that we wanted flying cars, instead we got 140 characters. What have you got against Twitter? Well, well, you have to always put this in some, some context. So I think that, um, so it's, it's, uh, I, I think that Twitter is a, has a great business model. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's in some ways so, such a good business model that, um, and when you have a monopoly like Twitter has on, on the service they, they built out, uh, you often don't have to run your business uh, in quite as operationally uh, tight a way as, uh, you are, as you would if you were, say, opening a restaurant or something like that. So, 
So I think uh, Twitter is a great business, but uh, there is always a sense that it's not enough to um, take our civilization to the next level. And this is always sort of the idea that we need to do things not just in the world of bits, we should also be trying to do more things in, in the world of atoms. The narratives we always tell in our, our media are ones of specific failure linked to general failure, so, uh, or specific success linked to general success. And so it would be, Twitter is a great business, and therefore, look at how much is happening in technology. Um, and I think we, we need to consider that uh, it's, it's a specific success that's perhaps obscuring a lot of general failures. You know, the, the, uh, the cell phones that, uh, um, that distract us from our surroundings also distract us from the fact that our surroundings are strangely old, that we live in these old cities where transportation systems are maybe from the 19th or early 20th century, where you know, a lot of stuff has not changed in a very long time. And so, so, I, it's, it's sort of, so yes, I think Twitter itself is a great company. Um, it's not enough to take us to the next level. Now, I, 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 now it's, it's always, this often gets framed as you know, a critique of the Twitter founders. Well, why couldn't they have built something mm -hmm. like flying cars? And I think that's, that's very unfair because they did build a great company, and we shouldn't blame them. It, it really, the blame is on all of us for not working on these other things. There is a startup in Slovakia that we just featured in Wired called Aeromobile that is making a flying car, by the way. What do you think when you see Uber valued at 17 billion and WhatsApp bought for $19 billion and Snapchat worth somewhere above $10 billion? What do you think about the, the valuations? Well, uh, there's, there is sort of always this recurrent question whether we have a bubble in technology like we had in the, in the late 90s. Uh, I tend to think that there is no bubble in, in tech because uh, these bubbles are psychosocial phenomena in which you get the entire public uh, involved. And, um, and the public has largely been absent this time around. The IPOs are happening very, very late. There are far fewer of them than there were in the late 90s. And so you do not have the sort of public frenzy around technology that you had in 99, uh, 2000. Uh, you know, if I had to identify a bubble today, and we had a bubble in tech in the 90s, we had a housing finance one in the last decade, the, the obvious place where the bubble exists today is in uh, government, and it's in, you know, government's printing money, it's in, uh, it's in government bonds probably, which is what, what a governments are sort of buying up with all the money they're printing. And so I think that the place that our bubble, and you know, in some ways, the interest rates that are set by the government touch everything, but uh, the center of the bubble are probably things that are most like government bonds. It's government bonds, corporate bonds, maybe it's uh, parts of the housing market that are very linked to fixed income, maybe it's uh, parts of the equity market that behave like fixed income, so it's stocks that pay high dividends, or it's, uh, or it's these sort of value stocks where you have very predictable ca cash flows, um, whereas the, Tech stocks are primarily valued on growth, which is a very different variable. I personally have about three quarters of my net worth tied up in illiquid tech stocks in Silicon Valley and, and elsewhere. And um, I, I actually think that it's one of the best places to hide from this massive government bubble that exists everywhere else. So I, I think there is a bubble. It's not in tech. It's in government. And I, I invest in tech in order to hide from the bubble in government. What is the one that you wish you'd invested in that you missed? Well, there always are, there always are um, many uh, misses and, uh, that one, one has. Um, uh, but you know, I, th I think sort of the, the misses that really that count as misses are ones where you spend some time talking to the company, you have a real conversation, you really think about it. So I missed out on you know, the Series A round at YouTube. I missed out on the Series A round at Zynga. I had you know, lots of conversations with Mark Pincus and known him for many years and was very close to doing it. But far bigger miss than those two uh, was not doing the Series B round at, at Facebook. Um, and, um, and I think it's sort of very instructive uh, sort of set of mistakes that happened. Um, you know, on the, on the, on the um, you know, we'd done this, I was the seed investor, did the Series A round um, August of 2004. It had sort of a post money valuation of 5.6, 5.7 million. And, and Facebook was just growing very fast. Sort of eight months later, um, you know, they, they sort of uh, 
got this financing round. The Washington Post was offering 50 million, and then you know Excel uh, venture fund Silicon Valley came in much higher valuation at 85 million. Um, it was 12 times the price per share of the of the uh, of the first round, the middle of dilution, but so with much higher valuation in just eight months. And uh, I had this, this conversation with uh, with Mark, and it was like, you know, why don't you do the this whole round? Kind of like you and. Said, well, it's like gone up so much, and and it felt like we had really maximized the valuation, um, and 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 part of the psychology was that on the inside, it didn't feel like things had changed that much. You had this horrible graffiti art on the wall of the office. There were sort of it was still only eight or nine people. So every day that you went to the office, uh, you it actually felt like it was the same company you had been at the day before. Um, it was true there were these, uh, these uh, charts where things were moving in a very happy north northeasterly direction, but, um, but they were very, these were abstractions that people, I think, didn't fully, fully get in a way. And so, um, so, um, and so whenever you have these massive up rounds in companies led by, um, by smart investors, um, almost as a rule of thumb, uh, they are undervalued. And I've done this back testing on this where the steeper the up round, the greater the undervaluation. And it's because when these companies have momentum, people underestimate the momentum. They underestimate when things change. They underestimate how much things have changed. And it's not just true of the outside investors. It's also true of the people on the inside. You know, I, I course corrected on this in the Series C round in Facebook, which was at 525 million pre just one year later. And so it was like 5x again. And, uh, and it was sort of this question, what, did, what had I done wrong? And, and I, think, I think it was like, okay, this, this makes no sense at all. This is a really crazy valuation, but I'm, I'm gonna still invest because um, there's something about the momentum that people are missing. And that, that, was, that was actually a, um, a round that I'm very glad to have participated in. How did it work out? Well, so it, Facebook is worth more than 550 million, which is the post money on that round today. Just last question for me before I revoke my monopoly position and invite the room to ask some questions. What does Facebook become long term? You know, I, I have to always be a little bit careful what I say about Facebook since I'm on the board of directors there. But I, th I think, you know, I think that I, I think it is um, it is a founder-led company, uh, which means that um, it will uh, it will it's very focused on innovation, on continuing to develop a lot of new things broadly in this in this uh, social networking space. Um, I'm I'm generally the most bullish on the founder-led companies in Silicon Valley, you know, Amazon, Google, Facebook. Uh, Jobs did a phenomenal job when he came back to Apple. And there is a certain amount of freedom that founders have that the um, politician slash CEO people that often get brought in to run these companies simply uh, do not have. So we have two rules for the questions now. Um, the first rule is it must have a question mark at the end. And the second rule is it must be a genuine question about Peter, not some of your own projects. And anybody who disobeys gets put on a floating country somewhere off California. Um, if we could have the lights up a little, and there are people with microphones, and if you would like to ask Peter a question, raise your hand. And there's a hand that's just shot up over there. And we can have another microphone somewhere at the back over there. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, I'm quite interested uh, because you obviously started speaking, and the book's mainly about zero to one, about making you know a completely new market in which to fill. I wanted to get your opinion on the kind of the business model behind Rocket Internet because, of course, they're the complete opposite of we just completely copy and imitate at speed. Well, I don't. I don't think it's a technology company. I mean, it's a it's a globalization play. It's it's about copying things that work and uh, and sort of. Um, um, copying them elsewhere in the world, um, and so uh, it, it may work. Uh, it uh, it uh, you know it's uh, you have to. You have, there, I think there are some tough questions about how is Rocket different from Idea Lab, which was sort of had had this incubation model that, that blew up famously in the late '90s. I think the the argument Rocket would make that is different is that it has a formula that it's just repeating mechanically, um, and I think it's a it's a play on globalization. I, I, I'm not interested. That much in globalization, I think it's important, but I'm, I'm much more interested in technology. But I think investors have to evaluate it as as a as a 
you know, as a, as a globalization play. It's like investing in McDonald's in China or something like that. There's a question over here, and then another hand on this side. I've got a mic here, if that's okay. My name's Katie, I'm from Nine Others, and thank you very much, Peter. I really appreciate your time speaking to us. I think we've all been inspired by your book and by your story. And what I'd like to know is what inspires you? Where do you go to to find inspiration from what you read or who you meet or places you visit and that sort of thing? Well, it's, um, I'm always really bad at answering these sorts of personal questions, but, but I, th I think it's, I, f I find tremendous inspiration from just uh, all the terrific people that I, I get to work with. Uh, you know, so there's something, there's a dynamism to that that's uh, that's incredibly uh, incredibly uh, motivating and inspiring, and uh, you know I, th I think there are all these ways in which uh, one can be pessimistic about certain trends and certain things in our societies, but uh, but I, I think there there is sort of a very powerful antidote in, in the sort of indomitability of the human spirit that is sort of a uh, an enormous part of the of the tech scene in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. Is there a microphone with somebody here? <clears throat> Hi, Peter. Uh, one question. Why you are so sure that the next innovation wave will be in the States? If necessity is a mother of innovation, I think there is a very interesting story in Japan also. The flash and trap for 20 years, uh, good infrastructure in robotics, Fukushima tragedy, geopolitical problems. Mm -hmm. So, what about Japan? Well, I think I think Japan is is very interesting. There's there's definitely a logic. I, I would look. I, I generally think the place to look is the developed world because that's that's the place where people need to do new things. The, the developing world, they can just copy stuff. Um, so, I, I I do think you look at U.S., Scandinavia, you know, Northern Europe, U.K., Israel. Um, and then Australia, Canada, New Zealand, um, and uh, and then I think certainly uh, Japan is is a very interesting one. It's um, it's you know it is um, it's culturally not a place where people typically start companies. So that's it's sort of so uh, the idea of doing something new in a small company is is sort of a is is a is a modality that, is, that does not exist. Um, so I think I think there may be a lot of innovation in Japan, but it may strangely happen in, in more in larger companies than in smaller companies. That, that, that would be my guess. But I think I think it's very interesting, and it's uh, it's definitely um, this is still the third largest economy in the world, and it, it's weirdly uh, very off the radar. How much of your investing are you doing outside the U.S.? The, the bulk is the bulk is in the U.S. It's always you know it's always we it's it always ends up uh, there's always sort of some Connection we have to the people, where they come strongly recommended in one way or another. But we've we've done you know we've done some things here in the UK. We've done a few things in the rest of Europe. We've done some things in Israel. We've done some things in Australia, New Zealand. So we've done some things all over. Does somebody have a microphone on this side? Um, I was going to say you said that you know, albeit Asperger's is the key to innovation. And Facebook is taking all this data and curating a social experience. And it's, it's almost rewarding people to kind of complete, continue to socialize. So how does that, they take all that data and make people innovate again? I mean, you've got a huge community listening to you and you're kind of curating their social experience, but are you necessarily helping that population innovate for themselves? Um, and how do you sort of take their data forward and do something more exciting, like maybe what Google's doing, um, and continue to kind of innovate society rather than reward it for sort of Gaming social psychology. Well, I, I, um, you know, I, I think I think there are sort of all these different different parts going on. I, I think I, I certainly do think that um, that if you if you are constantly getting feedback on on your ideas and discouraged from having unconventional ideas, that that is a big problem. I'm, I'm not I'm not convinced that that's fundamentally what happens on on, on Facebook, but uh, but it is. I think it's a problem. That we have um, in society in, in general, uh, and it's something that we all need to work on overcoming. Um, and it's 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 very unfair to blame it on any single company. I would say I, I don't think Facebook's doing it, but um, and it's unfair because I think this is this is a problem that's endemic to society. We live in society. We're sort of social beings on some level, and and so we 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 always uh, take our cues from the people around us and. 
uh, often get talked out of our good ideas from the people around us. So it's, it's a very deep problem. There's probably space for two more questions. And there was somebody over here. Um, hi there. I was just wondering if you could um, actually describe your first meeting with Mark Zuckerberg. You know, he was 19 years old. Uh, he, was, uh, he was very um, introverted and rather quiet at the time. He still is somewhat introverted. Uh, he, um, you know, it, it seemed like the, the, we, we had done a lot. Um, my friend Reid Hoffman and I uh, had done a lot of homework on the whole social networking space. Um, you know, Reid had started a company called SocialNet all the way back in 1997, seven years earlier. Uh, and so we had thought about this a lot. And, um, and so it, it actually didn't depend that much on what happened in the meeting at all. We were going to invest just about no matter what. So we had the meeting for an hour, and then we wrote the check. But uh, we had we'd done our homework uh, beforehand. Um, I, I think the, the odd question about Facebook that's uh, very hard to get a handle on is uh, why nobody in Boston invested between February of 04 and August 04 when I met them in Silicon Valley. Um, and I have. I have this sort of crazy theory that uh, that um, there's, there's always sort of there always are these competitive dynamics people get caught up in that are that are very unhealthy. And I think one one version of it is that older people um, often don't want younger people to do better than hmm. themselves. And uh, and so if you're, uh, and I, I think there were these venture capitalists in Boston that uh, were personally annoyed at how well Zuckerberg was going to do. And it sort of stopped them in a way from making the investment. Um, what I told Zuckerberg when I when I made the investment was that I, I sincerely hoped that he would, be far wealthier and far more successful than I had ever been, and I'm very glad that happened. I interviewed Reid Hoffman, um, who was given the chance to lead the first round of investment. He was working with Sean Parker, and Sean Parker said, "Hey, I got these guys working at this place called thefacebook.com." And, and Reed nobly said, well, I think there might be a conflict of interest for me, but I'll introduce you to my friend Peter. So I asked Reed, um, does he regret that? How does he feel now? And he said, well, the money I don't regret, but I regret not having the chance to work with an entrepreneur hmm. like Mark. Um, last question. Peter, fascinated by your comments on education um, and uh, I loved, loved some of the points you made around um, secrets and uh, really, you know, how we're going to try and take civilization to the next level. My question is really, um, what's your view on MOOCs um, being the facilitator of that, opening up the new pioneer? Um, so I'm, it's, always, it's always a little bit uh, tricky if one has uh, too many companies of a given category. So. Uh, you know, you don't want to be the fourth online pet food company or the tenth thin film solar panel company, uh, and and so I, I I think there is this challenge of how are they differentiated from one another? What will what will really work? And so I always think that if we describe it at the level of MOOCs, we m maybe haven't uh, def defined the problem uh, properly. Um, but I, I do think you know I do think we're at a point where uh, the universities are going to change uh, radically. It is a it is an extremely, um, you know, it's an extremely uh, corrupt system we have at this point. There's, we have an education bubble. In the US, we have a trillion dollars of, of student debt. Uh, to a first approximation, this has gone to pay for a trillion dollars worth of lies about the value of the education people have received. Um, and um, and I, it's not at all obvious yet, though, what's going to, what's going to replace this or how it's going to change. Um, my, um, you know, the, the uh, you know, the, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical that it will be replaced by any sort of single unitary system. I, mean, I, have, I have this fellowship for uh, young people to st uh, start companies. Um, and you know, it's not, my claim is not that everybody should do this. I don't think everyone should become an entrepreneur. And I, th I think there is no one size fits all. I think, so I think the future will be much more heterogeneous, much more diverse in terms of what people do. Um, and uh, what's, what's really anomalous is the sort of unitary tracking, where you have to go to an elite college, you go to Yale or you go to jail. There's nothing else you can do, you know? Um, and so the, the, uh, I think the universities are, perhaps in um, 
perhaps in the same place as the Catholic Church was in 1514, if we go back 500 years, where uh, you had sort of this monolithic way, this universal uh, way of uh, body of knowledge of teaching things. The difference between the Yale and the Harvard political science faculties are probably no greater than the, the differences between the Dominicans and the Franciscans. So we have all kinds of small debates within this context. Um, uh, we, are, we have a system of indulgences uh, that's costing more and more to support this priestly or professorial class of people. Uh, we are told that uh, it's the only way to salvation. Um, you must get a diploma to be saved. If you do not get a diploma, then you will go to hell. Um, and I think, um, and I think the uh, I think the 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 message that I have that's uh, like the 16th century reformers that's a somewhat troubling message, is that uh, you have to work out your salvation on your own. You have to save yourself, and uh, and and that's that's I, th I believe that is the truth, but it's a uh, it's 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 a somewhat uncomfortable one. So Peter has agreed to sign some books, kind of at the back, outside here. Um, what you must then do is read the book, because it's a great, tightly written book, and then you need to start a monopoly, because otherwise tonight's wasted. Please can we thank Peter Thiel. Thank you.